Mercedes Sandoval was one pissed off feline when she tramped out of the bar following the news broadcast. Muggs and I had a little chuckle over the whole thing, but only long enough for me to have one more drink before I headed over to Carla's house. By the time I got there and she opened the door, that whole idea of smacking her seemed like a really fine one. But since it's not a good idea to assault one of your employees when they've been naughty, I stifled the urge and told her to make me a drink. Because it was clear I was in no mood to argue the point, she fetched the drink, set it down on the coffee table, and then took a seat in the chair across from me. I took a deep swig of the scotch, hoping the trail of liquid heat would temper my tone. Well, Carla, it seems you've been busy. I had some things to take care of out of town. I got back in time to meet Dell for the interview, but I haven't been back very long. She nodded toward a duffel bag sitting near the door. You shouldn't be mad, Morneau. You gave me the idea. I leaned back on the couch. Oh, this should be good. Do tell. When you told Dell that I'd give him an interview. Carla didn't look as chagrined as I thought her recent actions dictated. I see. So at no time did you think dragging everything out into the open might be a risk to you or to my business. No conflict of interest regarding our taking the Rios case. No worries about how the feds might handle this. No concern about Sandoval still out there with an axe to grind. I thought about all those things, and then I did what I thought was best. I just figured keeping you out of the loop would make it less complicated. I stood up and walked over to her large front window. Carla, in my line of work, our line of work, leaving me out of the loop, is never a good idea. But let's put that aside for a minute and talk about how I'm supposed to trust an assistant who isn't comfortable keeping me informed. An assistant that has no problem going off half-cocked at every bend. Can you see how that might be a problem? I can see that. She sounded just as tired and frustrated as I was. I can also see how well we work together, even with my tendency to go off half-cocked. But maybe you don't see it the same way, Morneau. That's something you're going to have to decide for yourself. I'll live with whatever decision you make. I've made some decisions of my own, actually. Something about that last sentence made me queasy. Are these decisions you plan on sharing freely? Or should we play a game of charades? Not everything is a joke, Morneau. Carla got up, grabbed my glass, and started toward the kitchen. I grabbed her elbow. I don't recall making a joke, Buttercup. I bought the Osceola Hotel. She was stealing herself for whatever argument she assumed I'd make once I found out why the hell she'd want to buy a dilapidated building two hours away. The building where Trudy had been held hostage as a young woman. I've even got enough left to renovate it. Why would you want to do that? I could tell she was trying not to cry. Take the place that killed Trudy and make something good out of it. I'm not going to let it all be for nothing. That is fucking unacceptable. Trudy may have cheated herself, but I'm not going to cheat her memory. I understood what she meant, and even though the dilapidated building didn't kill Trudy, what happened inside had been the prologue to her denouement. A long road of misery that taught herself abuse would always be safer than the horrors other human beings could perpetrate on her. I don't even need to close my eyes to imagine it. How all the hues faded to black and white. Not all at once. It's slow and painful. Once all that color's drained from your life, it's real hard to muster the will to pick up a brush and start painting everything back in. Particularly when your sorrow keeps plunking down in huge teardrops blurring all that effort to a dingy gray. I always saw Trudy as clearly as I see myself, and I guess that's why I liked her. I now understand that she was someone who was never destined to see life in high definition. Not after her time in that hotel. That's where she went gray. She didn't cheat herself, Carla. Life cheated her. 
Sometimes life's a bitch. I guess that's where that bumper sticker comes from. Carla gave me an eye roll, mostly to distract from the fact that she was swiping a tear from her cheek and having a hard time making eye contact. I was sure that what stood between us was the memory of a drunken utterance. This wasn't just about Trudy. This was about Carla and how she suddenly had the rest of her life before her and wasn't sure which direction to turn. She'd taken so many wrong ones. Now she was at that proverbial fork and wasn't so clear on where to go from here. Her instincts might be telling her to take one road, but her battered pride, coupled with everything she'd been through, was telling her to run in the opposite direction. I just wished we could rewind, go back to when I was exasperating her, and she was cursing a blue streak at me, with nothing more behind it than sexual tension and genuine frustration. But I knew the days of entertaining expletive-laden rebuffs circled the drain around the time she remembered saying those three words. She didn't have to mean them. I doubted she did. That wasn't the point. They were out there now, like a warning sign. Dangerous curves ahead, road under construction, dead end. Pick a sign, any sign. Any of those paths were bound to take us both somewhere neither of us should be heading. We were in the middle of one of those moments where two people are feeling pretty damn banged up, but neither party has the strength to say what they could say to make the other feel a little less bruised. Because somehow that would give the pain a name. When you name something, it's hard to let it go. So you fixed the place up. What then? I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the answer. Well, I guess it's got to generate some business so it pays for itself, but... I also want it to be something useful, something good. I'm thinking maybe a hotel, but the top few floors could be residential apartments, like a halfway house or something. People who qualify could work at the hotel until they get on their feet. I couldn't help but grab her and pull her to my chest. Her heart was always in the right place, even if what she wanted to do would probably end up being one hell of a mess. Still, I could see it. If anyone could make it work, Carla could. I kissed the top of her head. Okay, sunshine, I get it. You're trying to make a place Trudy could have escaped to. Thing is, I didn't want to hear anymore. I knew what it all meant. I understood I had to encourage her to go. And damned if it didn't piss me off. You're a pain in my ass, but I'm going to miss you. She looked up at me. I'm not going anywhere, Morno. I plan on you helping me with this project, because I'm going to ask nicely. I was glad I wouldn't be put through the hell of interviewing new assistant applicants, even though I'd been roped into her newest scheme. Okay, are we done hugging it out? Because i got to go pee. Oh, and I'm selling this house. It just hasn't felt the same since you killed that guy in the kitchen, so I talked to the super at your building, and I'm going to take over Trudy's apartment. I felt the contents of my sack take to higher ground as Carla buddy-punched me in the arm. We're going to be neighbors. Won't that be fun? I stood there for way longer than I should have before coming up with, didn't you have to pee? As Carla turned the knob on the bathroom door, the laughter echoing in the tiny hallway like an off-key glockenspiel was immediately (laughs) swallowed by a boom. (laughs) Tell me your first name. Still 
Guard War 18, left AC. Ready to set up the second line. The thing about being blind, when you're used to seeing people's emotions, is that not only can't you see them, you can't see how they feel. I'd only lost one sense, but it felt like I'd lost three. My sense of physical sight, my sense of emotional sight, and that special kind of alchemy, which results in the combination of the two. Something I'd apparently been relying on as a crutch but didn't even know existed until it was gone. Carla had been knocked across the hallway into her bedroom, so when she hit the floor and rolled backward, the blast had effectively shot her out of its trajectory. I had been standing a few feet away from her, but I don't even remember falling. Detective Lash, formerly with the Detroit PD, recently retired, and temporarily but grudgingly returned from his oasis in a warm, dry climate to help sort out what the hell was going on, had been by the hospital every day since they brought me in with third-degree burns on my chest and arms and a conspicuous absence of sight. Today, I was going home. I was also supposed to find out who was behind the bomb in Carla's bathroom. The earlier attack on her in the kitchen where Mercedes Sandoval had disappeared to, and maybe who was behind the Molotov cocktail at the meanwhile. Actually, these were just my questions in the form of loose ends, and I wasn't exactly sure what answers he'd bring when Lash clambered into my room and fell into the chair next to my bed. I knew it was him because he came around the same time every day, but even if he didn't, the man had a lumbering gait that I'd quickly pin down without needing to be told who was heavy footing it into the room. Another thing he did whenever he'd visit, which showed me that he wasn't as gruff and unfeeling as he'd like others to believe, is narrate the visuals, meaning what he was wearing, or how a nurse looked, or what new color of flowers Carla was delivering, and how her ass looked in her jeans. Whatever he saw, he described to me. So, we're bearing down on December, but I'm taking off this heavy jacket. And I want you to know that I've refused to relinquish the dream. Over my thermals, I'm wearing a yellow Hawaiian shirt. And if you could see it, you'd have something rude to say, I'm sure. Guess it's good I can't see it then, huh? Another thing Lash did was not get all pansy ass around me about the sight thing. Carla spoke too softly, and when she didn't, she was being a parody of herself, trying to somehow tether me to the past by overplaying how we used to communicate when both of us could see. She didn't curse around me much anymore either, and I could tell it wasn't inadvertent. Nothing about her presence was comfortable these days, and I suspect she felt the same way. We didn't talk about it. She brought in work was always there when the doctor came with updates, and jumped right on the it-may-not-be-permanent bandwagon with an enthusiasm I can only describe as desperate. What do we know? I heard him shuffle through papers. I made a few notes here, but I can't read my goddamn writing, so I'll just bullet point it. The guy who attacked Carla in her kitchen 
was a friend of a cousin of Rios. He had an Argentinian connection. So we figure either Rios or family hired the guy to grab her up, since they didn't get her at the meanwhile. Forensics taken at the Bethany Keene murder indicate he's the same guy who slit her throat in the daycare parking lot. We've put the hammer down pretty hard on Carringer, and the feds have been through his office and home. Don't think he's in on any of the embezzlement, which leaves Mercedes Sandoval, who is presently unaccounted for, in addition to a large chunk of change from another business account. You'll be lucky if you find that one. She's frisky. Lash grunted in agreement. Seeing as he's dead, it's doubtful the state of Florida will do anything about the murders. But from the buzz I'm hearing, both Sandoval and Rios will be tried for embezzlement if the feds can get Carringer to cooperate. It's the only way Uncle Sam can save face if those federal contracts find their way into the harsh light of day. Sure makes it easier if neither one of their defendants are present for trial. And we know Rios won't be stopping by. I understood what Lash was trying to tell me. Those contracts meant something to a few people, including, but not limited to, Mercedes Sandoval and the federal government. It wasn't likely the feds would stop looking for them. If they thought there was a chance, they'd come back to bite them in the ass. Same with Sandoval. Which meant Carla and I had a loose end we'd have to decide how to tie up at some point. I heard paper being crumpled as Lash continued. There's no way of knowing about the bottle through the window at the meanwhile. No forensic evidence or fingerprints, so we'll have to write that one off. If I had to guess, I'd say Mercedes hired someone. But you know how I feel about the feds. Wouldn't put it past them to needle you a little just to see what shakes out. I sat up and adjusted my pillow. Speaking of... The bag's still where it was, and I made Carla bring me down and show me. We got another one for the papers you guys were holding on to, and she handed over the keys. They're in the gun safe at my office. Let me know when, and I'll bring them to you. There was a very low probability of someone listening in. But Lash was being indirect all the same. Anyone monitoring our conversation still wouldn't know where the money or the papers were. But I could now rest more easily, knowing both were safely stashed in lockers at the Amtrak station. You sure you want to go back to Arizona or Boca Raton or wherever the hell you've decided to sweat away the final days of your life? I could probably use you around here for a while. Screw you, Morneau. You're getting out of that bed, you'll buy yourself a cane, and that red-headed secretary of yours will lead you around by the nose for the rest of your life, out of a misplaced sense of guilt. Another couple things to add to his list of attributes. Lash will tell it like it is, and doesn't suffer a fool's suffering well. One last thing, and then I pass this shitstorm off to my replacement. It's too fucking cold in this bird. My nutsack was just starting to unshrivel. I felt Lash's hand on my arm. That bomb in Carla's bathroom is something else, Morno. You and that secretary of yours make any new enemies lately? Because if I were a betting man, I'd say that one isn't tied to the Rios case. And you've got something more on your plate. The Dex Morno series by Jenny Decker. Narrated by Greg Kreitz and Jenny Decker. Music by Blue Dot Sessions. And if you are enjoying the podcast, I would be very grateful if you gave us a review. Thank you so much for listening. Season 3, coming up shortly.